Welcome everybody to the Mill Valley Film Festival. We're so happy to have you here in conversation with uh, teen filmmakers and mentors of Black Girls Film Camp. Um, my name is Shakira Rifos and I'm the Education Outreach Manager at the California Film Institute. Um, and we're happy to have you here as a part of our education offering for this year's program. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna kick off this conversation by reading a brief introduction then I'm going to introduce all of the panelists present here, and then we're gonna get the conversation going. Um, the entire education department here at the California Film Institute, home of the Mill Valley Film Festival, have been fans of Jamika since we were introduced to her work on media literacy through a documentary called Trust Me. I myself as an educator and an audience member following her vision um, I see her acknowledgement that every Black girl has the potential to be a griot for their generation by sharing their experiences, having these experiences be affirmed as both unique and shared common truths of being a teenager right now. Jamika's work also exposes the realities of the efforts and commitment it takes when we choose to prioritize the representation of Black girlhood through film. Jessica Johnson, Kristen Jackson, and Sanal Wilkins are three of the teen filmmakers with us in conversation today. Uh, ladies, it's an extremely generous thing to allow adults and strangers a view into your teenage lives through your personal narratives. It's extremely vulnerable. And the minds of young people can sometimes be uh, a mystery to us. So we appreciate that. It becomes specifically meaningful to watch the inaugural class of Black Girls Film Camp share how you are experiencing the first of many emotions that will guide you through your lives as young adults. You share stories of triumph, self-actualization, and joy, but also isolation, disappointment, loss of love, and the confusion that comes with one shifting perspective out of Black girlhood into Black womanhood. As a programmer and an arts administrator in film, my main professional goal is to leave this industry a better place than how I found it. My hope for every young Black creative and future filmmaker watching this conversation is that you will find inspiration in the courage of all 10 filmmakers featured in this camp, that you may feel a bond and the knowledge that there is a place for your specific story. There is an audience looking for you to share this story however you choose to. We're waiting for you. During this one hour discussion, Black Girls Film Camp participants and award-winning filmmakers and mentors will engage in a conversation centering the experiences of Black girl voices in film. With a new and old school lens from future Black girl filmmakers and industry veterans, our panel today will discuss topics ranging from Black girl invisibility to counter storytelling and finding one's voice in the field. Teen filmmakers will also share stories and inspiration behind their films created at this year's Black Girls Film Camp. So the Mill Valley Film Festival Education Department is grateful to introduce you to the talent who have agreed to share space with us today. First and foremost, uh, guest curator and the hardest uh, woman working in show business right now, executive director of I Am Not The Media Inc. and the driving force behind Black Girls Film Camp, Jamika Anderson. Hi, Jamika. Next up, our teen filmmakers and part of the inaugural Black Girls Film Camp class, Jessica, Kristen, and Sanal Wilkins. Hi, y'all. And with us to represent a well-decorated team of mentors and industry professionals involved in this year's curriculum, we have the veterans. NAACP Image Award winner, Nichelle Tramble Spellman. Good morning, Nichelle. Hello. Telly Award winner, Karen Peterkin. Hi, Karen. Hi. An Academy Award women winner, Karen Tolliver. Hi, Karen. Hey, good morning. All right. So thank you all for joining us. I have to admit, my introduction made me a little emotional. I'm like, ah, that was good. <laughs> it's like, it's such a visceral feeling when like, as an adult in the industry, you're watching like uh, young people, like uh, young people are so radical, right? They're like way more radical than any of us ever were, than I am. And it's so um, empowering for me and emotional to watch like um, these stories come to life and really watch young black girls own their own narratives. 
Uh, Jamika, when you conceptualized um, this film camp, what was it? Was there a light bulb that went off, or was this like a slow roll of uh, of uh, putting this program together? Um, I would say it's been a process um, to get to the point where the vision came in alignment because I have been doing media literacy for over 10 years with my nonprofit with working with adolescents, but it wasn't until um, around 2018 when I entered my PhD program and my research was centered on um, Black youth, but then I really kind of um, basically zeroed in on Black girls and the challenges that they've been experiencing. Um, in schools and education. Um, and then I was like, I need to do something about it with the work that I'm already doing and wanting to create this space that I, I want to hone in as a counter space, a space that's liberating, a space where they can be their authentic selves and share their stories. And then that's where I was like, okay, I want to do a film camp with Black girls, media, Black girls censoring their stories. And um, it just all came into play. And then all these amazing people started being involved. It was a snowball effect that, that was inevitable, I think. Um, it was driven in purpose. So, Jamika, can you talk a little bit about kind of your experience with um, what you call of uh, the erasure of, of uh, Black stories or Black girl stories. Can you talk a little bit about um, your personal experience there and what really like, what, what point was it that you said, I'm going to be the one to change the game right now? Yes. Yeah, so Honestly, if you are a Black girl living, I think that we've all had a mo moments where we felt invisible in, in different spaces <laughs> um, beyond film. Um, but it's, it's that realization also when you enter rooms and you're the only Black girl. And even in those spaces, sometimes you feel as if your stories aren't welcome, your voice isn't welcome. But beyond that, it was also me reflecting on... Um, the experiences that I had in my life with art and creativity where I felt as my most authentic self. And I said, you know what? I really want to put this into play and in creating this opportunity for girls that may not have that access to create, to really play, to really share, um, but also to um, have camaraderie with other girls and women that look like them for them to see um, Black women that are successful and thriving, um, that have had success in sharing their stories and telling stories. And so um, that's the reason why I was like, okay, this definitely has to happen. So Karen, Michelle, and uh, Karen as well, um, you talked about, you mentioned that you all have known each other for uh, a while as industry veterans. You were like a part of the same uh, cohort somewhat. Um, when Jamika talks about like feeling invisible in rooms and spaces, can you talk uh, each talk just a little bit about um, those feelings uh, uh, coming up and um, how important it is for you to uh, to help change that 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 narrative and those feelings of isolation for young creatives? You know, I think that you could tell by the fact that we've all been friends for over 20 years, that when you meet, I, I refer to it as our, your pledge class, <laughs> as you meet your pledge class when you get into this industry and you grow up together. And Karen and I, uh, Karen Tolliver and I met each other because we lived in the same apartment building when we both moved to LA, like Melrose Place, <laughs> and um, developed a friendship from there. And then Karen Tolliver knew Karen Peterkin and then we all met each other. And so we've been support. I mean, there were the years where we were, you know, all struggling, all trying to make it, all trying to find jobs, all trying to piece together jobs to make a living. And then as we started to get um, hired and staffed, we still relied on each other. So I think that our reaction to being invisible and feeling as if you're the only one we supplemented that by our relationships outside of our jobs. They benefited our jobs, They're, they benefited our mental health. And it's now, we're now sisters, it's been so long. And that is so important when you start to find your support system, find your pledge class and find the people that you could rely on and that you can support. Be the friend that you need and it will nourish you as you go forward in this business. 
So beautifully said, Michelle. It's true. It's so I think, you know, it's very difficult being a woman of color in this industry. You know, when we were coming up uh, with my background being um, a development executive and a producer, I've been in those rooms where, you know, white executives would say, oh, it's hard to find a black writer. And I once I started to find my voice, I would say, listen, I can give you five names off the top of my head. I can really give you 10. And by the end of the day, I can give you 30 or 40. And there were occasions where, you know, different agents or different executives who I didn't even know would reach out to me and just say, you know, I understand that you have a connection to black writers. I have the same connection that you can have. I'm happy to share these names. Um, and so it's important that as you're building your friendships, I'd say it's, it's, Number one, to find balance in your work and your home life, you know, your work and your personal life. And like Michelle said, you know, we our relationships benefit our work lives and, and our careers, but they benefit and nourish us as women and as black women. And, you know, we make it a point to do the same for the younger women coming up. You know, we try to pay it forward as much as we can. Michelle and Karen are two of the um I would say biggest mentors I can imagine, you know, they will, Karen, Michelle will help out young writers. Karen will help out young writers, young executives, and they don't even think twice about it. In addition to their very busy schedules, I try to do the same thing in terms of assistance in our offices, wherever I work and interns, wherever I work, especially, you know, I, we all try to target and zero in on black women because there's so few of us and it's hard enough to get people to see you and take you seriously and know that you're just as smart as they are if not smarter and that you you know have this plethora of knowledge about lots of things that aren't expected um you know you're constantly having to prove yourself so it's just nice that when you have developed this cohort where you can be yourself and you can just relax and there are times where we never talk about work and we just talk about our lives and what we're doing these ladies were you know they came to my wedding um you know i've known them since before they were married you know and they've known me since before i was married and they truly are my sisters and that's something that we develop Developed over the years. Karen yeah. Oliver, can I can I ask you a more specific question? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, and just listening to um, listening to Nichelle and Karen, um, where do you find like a, a sweet spot or a point of hope in the industry now for young creatives coming up, as opposed to the struggles that um, you all saw as you were um, gaining access? Great question. Look, the answers on the screen and these ladies, these filmmakers here and Jamaica's work, I mean, because of course the obvious is we wish we had something like this when we were starting, but we kind of may do. Um, but what I love, I mean, just quickly, my personal feeling was when I, I, I grew up in Texas, when I came to LA, I was, you know, didn't know anybody, which is why when I, Michelle and I were living in the same building and I met Peterkin, it was like, you know, it was my tribe, but I had a roller coaster of emotions between coming really bold and thought I was going to change the world and, and then getting kind of slapped in the face a little bit and then shrinking, you know, literally shrinking, like being the person at the studio, you know, I was working always for a very long time at the studios and I was recommending writers, like Karen said, and wasn't bold enough to say, hey, I've got five black writers. I would say that and they would say, yeah, but they're, you can't get them hired. They're not studio approved or something. And rather than fighting at the time, I took that as gospel. Like, OK, well, let me go find the writers that they can approve. And the the hope of the future is that those days are gone, that people know that they can't do that anymore, and that these ladies on the screen coming in are so confident and they know what they're bringing to the table that they don't, they're not gonna take the no's that I think that we accepted when we first started. And so that gives me such hope and excitement for the future. And, you know, we don't know it's, it is a roller coaster and there's gonna be doors that shut all the time. But I think the momentum of things being more positive will keep us so that we won't doubt ourselves anymore. And and your tribe is everything. So I'm, I'm again, just so grateful that you guys have this and just could be more excited about the future. Oh, that's awesome, Karen. Thank you. Um, before we uh, pivot to the uh, teen filmmakers here, uh, Jamika, you are really like just a, a shining, brilliant example of asking for what you want. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about how, um, you know, uh, Karen Tolliver just mentioned um, young people not taking um, a certain treatment um, the same way that uh, those uh, before may ha had to have in order to keep working. But even further than that, like, you know, saying we're not going to be treated like this, but like asking for what you want, going after the mentorship you want, going after the job you want. Can you talk about how your experience in creating the film camp, getting this amazing, amazing selection of veterans together with a production value that was just like out of this world for your showcase. Can you talk about the power of just like going for it, going for what you want? So I, I really do believe that um, yes. the universe has mercy for a um, consistent and persistent heart. <laughs> um, I will say that I am a strong believer that if um, opportunity isn't given, build the house, create the door and create access. Um, that's uh, that's evident even with me starting. I am not the media like I, I was working full time for so many years while I was doing that nonprofit. But um, there were opportunities that were, weren't provided for me or I didn't have access to um, in my career when I first started in my 20s that I said, hey, I'm going to go and do my own thing. And no matter what it takes, um, I kind of had to take on that hustle mentality, you know, get do what you can until you get what you want kind of situation. Um, but there's still a level of humility um, that has to be there um, in your spirit. I, I'm not I'm not afraid of the nose, <laughs> I'm not afraid of the nose. So it's like even if you can't, it's OK. Um, but I might ask you later on, you know, keep me keep me on the radar. Um, and then I, I'm just so grateful for having relationships. And I think that there's this level of authenticity that's important when you do ask for things, because I think that when people know your spirit and they know your intentions, they're more likely. And I think that um, my fruits have showed where the seeds of my heart is with the work that I've been doing with teens for over 10 plus years. Um, I literally started, I am not the media when I was 25 years old and I, you know, been doing this work for so long. And then to have these relationships with like Karen, who is um, really connected to me through family, um, one of my best friends and, you know, Karen's like family to me and just having these connections and relationships that are so positive and fruitful. Um, I think that when you do set yourself up and position yourself, someone can say yes, but I will tell you this, it, there's preparation that has to go behind the scenes. Cause I, Karen's like, hold on, what is X? What is Y? What is Z? Before I even you know, commit. So it's like really thinking through your ask as well. So I, you know, that's one of those things that I take into consideration as I continue to propel and ask the universe, ask amazing women like these um, women right here to, to be involved and to be aligned in this work. Um, we're going to go to the panelists, but Jamika, your uh, uh, answer did inspire me. Uh, Karen Peterkin, Nichelle, and Karen Tolliver. Um, do you see any like downside to asking um, for mentorship from someone you admire or someone who has a career path you admire? Do you see a downside to ever just trying not at all. I mean, the only thing I would say to that is sometimes just saying, let me say this, I get mentorship, like Karen said, from my peers, from my sisters, from everyone, my assistant from all over the place. And so sometimes that word mentorship, if you say, will you be my mentor? Sounds like, you know, will you get married or just yeah. a big commitment? But if you, if you treat them like they're your mentor, regardless, and just ask those questions, ask specific questions, then you get specific answers. So don't look at it as sort of some global thing, just really just engage, you know, as if it already is. And I'm much more willing to help somebody if they say, hey, can you help me meet this person? I need to do this. Or, hey, how do I do this? Just ask a specific thing. And before you know it, I'm your mentor. I think that's true. And I, there is no downside because if you ask and they tell you no, you've broken through a barrier and you've done something that you've set out to do for yourself. So you've achieved that goal. So the answer doesn't matter. You put your foot forward. And then if you, they say yes, then you've entered into a relationship that's going to be fruitful and hopefully kind and compassionate and helpful. And the way to be a good mentee, which is what I always tell anyone that asks, if we have a meeting, be on time. 
if we're going to, if I, if I send you an email that needs an answer, you need to answer it. You have to do your part of it because as you know, we set up top, everybody is extremely busy. And so when I'm running a show, my day is broken up into 15, 20 minute increments. So if you're late, you've now domino affected my entire day and I'm not going to forget that. So you, I want to be the best mentor I can to a mentee who does their part. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with everything they both said. And then I think also it's important to be honest in your intentions. You know, um, you don't just approach someone to be your mentor, develop a relationship with them. You know, you can ask questions. I love what Karen said about, you know, the globalization of, oh, will you be my mentor? It's like, will you marry me? But you develop this relationship with this person and you ask them questions and you become interested in what they're doing. You know, if it's someone who is in a career or has a career trajectory that you would like to have, you know, a similar one, you know, do your research, look into their background, find out what they've done. What are they like? What are they working on? And ask questions about that, you know? Um, and then when you get to a point where you need advice or you need an introduction, they're not going to think twice about it. You know, they will absolutely do it. They'll make that connection for you because they know you, they believe in you, they know you're consistent and they know that you're not going to be the person who, if they do make this introduction and you are able to get a meeting that they know you will show up on time and they know that you will do all the things that you're supposed to do, because that's the one thing, you know, to me, time is money. And I don't have a lot of time. My time is very valuable and I'm happy to share it. But if you are late or if you misuse that time, then I can't say that I'll give you that time again. All right. All the young people watching, you are getting some <laughs> great free advice right here. I hope you all are taking notes. Um, let's pivot and uh, give some attention to uh, the well-deserving filmmakers in our presence today. Um, uh, Elizabeth Reynolds is one of uh, the curators that have put together the youth submission program for this year's Knoll Valley Film Festival. Um, Elizabeth, together with a group of her peers, um, watched about 11 hours of short films put together by youth uh, under 18, uh, and they produced a brilliant 90 minute program. Along with that, they also watched Black Girls Film Camp. Um, from front to back, and they formulated some questions and had some really interesting thoughts about the work. And Elizabeth, I'm going to uh, let you take it away. Why don't you uh, uh, give the opportunity to uh, the filmmakers to uh, talk about their uh, their stories? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'd like to first start off with um, Jessica, your film, Colorblind. And something that I noticed, a motif within the film, whether it was active or more passive was uh, the use of your dolls. And I was wondering what did the dolls then symbolize and how did they help aid that narrative you created of adulthood, naivete and change? Hi, Elizabeth, thank you for the question. That's actually something I haven't been asked by anybody. So that's good. Um, so with the dolls, the significance, I would say, and how they represented the naivete, um, which was the overarching theme of Colorblind. When I was growing up, well, let me start off by saying that that was a story that was, um, that actually occurred in my life. I had a best friend that I had lost um, due to the issues, not just with George Floyd, but everything that erupted in 2020. Um, and so that was something that was a loss that I was still dealing with. And you can ask um, Ms. Kima, Ms. Jamika, when we had the in-person um, event, I broke down and I was a mess. <laughs> but um, the dolls was something that we always used to play with when we were younger. We were obsessed. I probably had about a collection of at least a hundred dolls <laughs> in my room, which I had to get rid of eventually. Um, and so I would say the main symbolism behind that was that I, as an African-American girl growing into an African-American teen, was that those dolls with their straight hair, their fair complexion, um, 
even like the styles that I would see on Barbie dolls that they would be worn and how I would interact and play with the dolls with my best friend would always resemble um, white America essentially. And so I think that that was something that I kind of adapted as a form of beauty. Um, seeing like my Barbie dolls or American Girl dolls or whatever dolls that I would be playing with, that was kind of my perception of like a perfect life or what I should strive to be like, or even what kind of clothes I should wear. And so I think that growing from in the movie from the um, little girl to the older version of myself, um, you can kind of see that it kind of inflicted the way that I was acting or interacting with the best friend in the movie. Um, and I think that it kind of grew. I don't know if a lot of people noticed this, but it was kind of a little tidbit in the beginning of the second part of the movie. Um, behind the bed, there was a collage of um, different newspaper clippings that all showcased European fashion and white women that were modeling and probably a size double zero. <laughs> um, and that was something that I wanted to include because I wanted to showcase that the transition from being obsessed with these dolls and thinking that that was something that I needed to strive to be kind of translated even as I was a teen into an older, a more mature version of that, but still something that was very active and present within my life. And um, I think that also resi resembled, excuse me, the um, theme of kind of growing out of my naivete and realizing that that's not who I really needed to be. And I needed to embrace my blackness. <laughs> Amazing. Um, another thing um, I really noticed was um, the use of voiceover you had. And why include that instead of just having the simple dialogue between the two best friends? You know, what was it that the audience was able to learn about the main character's experience of, you know, the hardships of being a Black teen in America that they might not have got the same insight if it was just, again, the simple conversations between uh, the two friends? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would say the main thought process of that is that um, as a Black teen growing up um, in this era and day and age, it's very easy to feel silenced and suppressed in your voice. And for me, at least, a main outlet of how I express what I'm feeling is through my creativity and through my art. And so I think that a lot of the times, just on a day-to-day -day basis, everything that I may be feeling is being said in my head. So I'm not really saying um, exactly how I'm feeling with my friends and kind of expressing that on a day-to-day -day basis, which is sad and is something that needs to be changed. Um, but I think that kind of realizing or presenting in the, in the film the usage of the voiceover was kind of expressing that rather than just um, interacting with her best friend. Um, Thank you. One uh, last question. I, the, the title is very charged and I think that's a good thing when you are creating you know, any kind of artwork. It requires the audience to really pay attention. And with that conversation, you know, I think your piece kind of touched on this, but like, why is colorblind such a loaded term? You know, do people have good intentions sometimes when using this or kind of like with the friend, is it just sheer ignorance? <laughs> I think it does deserve, or it does depend on the person and how they are raised, um, the surroundings that they were brought up in. For my best friend in my experience, she went to an all basically predominantly a whole white school, a private school. Um, so she didn't really have any experience with um, really anybody of color. So I think the term colorblind has an impact whether they mean it or not in that sense. Um, it may not be meant to be an ignorant term, but I think that regardless of its meaning, it is because to be able to see someone or to be able to see someone like me, an African-American teen, you have to see my color because you have to see my struggle to understand who I am. Or else that's another, that's playing back into the part of the voiceover. You're not going to be able to 
understand me just by talking to me, you have to know what I go through on a day-to-day -day basis, or even in situations like George Floyd and other situations like that. I think that it's important to recognize somebody's skin color and their race and their culture, um, just to be able to truly understand who they are and their identity. Now, kind of moving on, uh, Kristen, your film was Transparency. And, uh, you know, it's very raw. And I was wondering, what was it like then to be emotional on camera? And how do you think that can inspire others, specifically women of color, to take strength in their vulnerability? Good question. Um, yes, when I was doing my film, that was not the idea that I had. Um, I'm a perfectionist, so I wrote out this nice little script, and I had a meeting with Ms. Jamika and Ms. Kima, and I thought I was going into it like, they're going to say, yes, this is the idea, and I was wrong, sadly mistaken, um, and they could tell, they were like, oh, everything is perfect, but we want to see what's behind the perfect Kristen, because I was taught to be polished and to never let people see you sweat and always give them what they want. And so we had a great raw conversation and we were talking and she was like emotions were erupting of different things like it's okay to be vulnerable. It was very difficult for me like when Ms. Kima interviewed me, I was giving the polished interview type answer and she was like no, let's go back say like what's on your heart and not be afraid of how it's going to come out and how people are going to receive it. So I just wanted to like through my film, encourage people to just speak what's on their heart. Give them that time to say, okay, reflect on what's going on. If it's, it's okay to cry. Like I was tired, don't let them see you cry. No, you wait till you get home and cry because you don't want people to see you vulnerable and different things like that. I feel like that's how I was raised. It's a tough exterior, polished and everything like that. But it's okay to give yourself a moment if you need to release those emotions. It's healthy because it's so unhealthy to keep it in. And I feel like a lot of people have suffered, especially youth have suffered because they have held it in. So I wanted to encourage people to let it out. And people are also touched by it. I got a lot of great feedback on it. Even though I was a little nervous about being vulnerable, I guess that it paid off in the end. Yes, that wonderfully said. Um, I really noticed that kind of how your film went and dismantled kind of um, the stereotype or the archetype within, um, you know, black media of the superwoman or like the savior, or the sacrificial black woman. And I thought that was um, really well done how you try to, you know, stay away from that and take time for yourself. And then um, how then do you think the uh, simplicity of your set, you know, how it was just you sitting with the camera played into your central theme of the importance of taking time for yourself. Yes, it was a great opportunity to just realize, get all the distractions out, it's just you. And it's like a blank canvas. And I feel like a lot of people can relate to simplicity. And if they're not distracted by, oh, that's a pretty set or this is, or this or that, and they're seeing all these other things and they're not focusing on what you're saying, your message. And I feel like that was like a blank canvas. I was able to sit there and it was just me and the people viewing. And I feel like they can just read like, okay, she's being very transparent and it's okay for me to do the same. Okay, I get her, this is vulnerability. And I'm reading that. And without the, all the outside distractions, um, it was a little nerve wracking because I was like, oh Lord, it's just me in a room. And I'm just talking, it's me and the camera and Ms. Kima. But um, she was saying, sure, some of the importance of that because I feel like if you get too flashy, then your message is lost. So there's beauty and simplicity. And I feel like people were able to see that through my film. So uh, your uh, film, Beauty Mark, um, first off, I really love how you use that term because it was kind of a reminder of what you went through and how you came out of it. And kind of, I wanna know what was your thought process with titling your piece? Um, my thought process so back in 2017, um, I was diagnosed with scoliosis and I was really concerned on um, how that would affect um, 
me in the future because I love to dance and I also do sports. So the thought behind my film was, especially as a black girl, we get overlooked. So I was just letting other black girls know, like the message in my film was that whatever you are going through, whether it's physically or mentally, um, I don't think it should stop you from doing what you love. And you don't have to think about what other people say about you. You just do what you love and you keep on going and you, you do what makes you happy. That was basically it. Um, dance is obviously a very um, poignant part of, in your film. So how do you think, or, you know, first off, what is your background in dance and how do you think that has affected your life and ultimately inspired this short film? Okay, so my background in dance. Um, I've been dancing since I was three years old and um, I've done praise dance. I've danced at like other people's events and stuff. So I really got connected to dance and um, I really like built a relationship to dance. And for me to be diagnosed with scoliosis, um, it was really hard for me because I didn't know how this was gonna affect my future and um, where this would lead to next, like whether I was gonna have to stop dance and try to find something else. Um, so it really gave me the courage and the confidence to keep pushing and um, to not worry about um, the bad things that's happening and that I need to do what I love. And I felt like it was um, good for me to put that in my film because I wanted to, I wanted to be an example to others that watch my film and for them to also get confidence from me and be like, you know, I don't have to stop what I'm doing. You know, I can, I can keep pushing. And um, I wanted them to also feel like they could be an example to others and yeah that was it thank you for your very triumphant story um all right thank Kristen, you Elizabeth. actually you know what, Elizabeth you had a question that I just would like uh Sana, Kristen and Jessica to answer do you need to have a background in the arts do you need to have an experience in the arts in order to shoot a personal narrative you do not have to have experience to make a film to express what your life has been like and the message that you want to portray and give your audience. You do not have to have any background experience. I feel like what you need to have is first a willing heart to learn because it's a process where you're going to have to learn a lot from people who have been in the industry way longer than you have and they have connections and they've learned so many things that you can learn from and you must be willing to learn because learning is a process it's not going to come like that it's a process and the second thing I would say is humility if you get put in your place you have to say okay I learned from it let's move on and you know embrace the experience and be humble because I feel like great things come to those who are grateful and humble I definitely agree with Kristen. Yes, you do not I have to have any experience um, in the arts or film or really in the entertainment industry at all. Um, I know a lot of us, or I'm going to speak for myself, I have had experience in the arts, so I think that that did help, but I had no experience with a camera. I had no experience um, getting different angles or getting a shot list or even really writing a script specifically for a film, which is totally different than like a play script or something like that. Um, so I think that you really just have to, like Kristen said, have a willingness to learn and um, be set in your place. I know that it was kind of, hard getting feedback on something that you're being vulnerable about, but it is something that you need because it's ultimately going to make you better. And I also think that um, just being passionate about the story that you're telling is really what's going to take you far. I think that if you have a relationship to whatever your, whatever message you're trying to convey, I think that it's going to ultimately come out in the way that you meant it and express what you wanted to express. I think that it, that's a definitely something that Kristen did very well. I want to shout her out. My mom was crying on your film. Um, just being passionate about what you're talking about is something that'll take you far. Um, I agree with both of them. They really like summed it up 
So um, I don't think you have to have experience in film. Um, I think, like they said, they really said everything. You know, you take advice from your mentors and your examples, and I think you use it um, in yours. And I think it's also great for um, you to try new things and because you never know what it would lead to. And um, yeah, I also think it's good to be creative. And even if you don't think you're good at it, I still think um, you should try because you never know how it's gonna turn out like us. It was our first time doing a film and it I think all of ours turned out great. So yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Sana. Um, I, I, I want to touch on something that uh, Kristen talked about and just um, talking about being uh, the ability, your ability to be emotional and to share your emotion and, you know, and, and not to hide. Um, I'm really I'm often like moved by my work in film and I'm really inspired uh, by all of the engagements I have with students. Um, my personal conflicts as a black woman in a primarily white space at work and where I live in Marin. Um, they frustrate me, they anger me. Um, I think being an arts administrator in film is like the coolest job in the world. I advise everyone to look into it, but I am often emotional and angry at work. And I cry in my boss's office more times than I would like to admit. Um, I'm, I'm sensitive. Uh, Karen Peterkins, Nichelle, and Karen Tolliver, is there room um, to be vulnerable and emotional in Hollywood? Do you have to be tough to survive? Is a thick skin necessary for uh, Black women to be successful? Or is there room to have vulnerability? I think a thick skin is, is important because you don't want the blows and to be so sensitive that the criticisms and the no's diminish who you are. I think that you take them in, but on a surface level only so that you could pivot and then you could learn from them and hear what's going on. But if you take it in constantly, 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 I see people leave the business all the time. So the three of us came out here to Los Angeles around the same time. And then we first started, I believe the whole crew was maybe close to 15, 20 women. And we're some of the only ones standing. So some of that was, you know, different choices, um, uh, you know, deciding that this wasn't the actual thing that they wanted to do. And some of it was just honestly being beat down. And mm -hmm. so you have to figure out a way. And we talked about this earlier when Peter can said it, the balance will give you armor. If you do not make this the most important thing in your life, doing my show, creating a show, writing is important to me, but it, I will never let it be more important than my husband, my sisters, my family, my friends, and even my dogs. So you have to figure out a way to balance because that balance will give you the protection that you need. Mm -hmm. You know, and one thing I think, you know, we, Michelle mentioned it earlier, mental health is extremely important and you have to take care of your mental health. And, you know, when you're constantly hearing no's or, you know, someone is giving you a note or an opinion on something that you've created and it might be different from what you feel, um, what I try to do is I remember when I was younger in my career, I heard someone say, divorce yourself from your words. So you've given birth to these words, you've presented them, and so they will be critiqued. You can't take it personally. You know, you have to let it go. And what I say is, if you hear the same note several times, then make the change, you know, make the change. If you hear it once, then maybe think about it and try and figure out, okay, does this make sense? You know, is this, can I do this? And, you know, whatever that, that winds up becoming. But just in terms of, I know what it's like when you are angry at work and when you feel like you're not being heard or you're being ignored and, you know, you just have to take that moment. And that is when you either text one of your girlfriends and say, girl, this is happening or you have to step outside. I have called people on the phone and said, can we talk about this real quick? 
I need you to talk me off the ledge. My husband is great at talking me off the ledge. You know, Michelle is one of the calmest people I know. You know, she's very good at talking you off the ledge or she will give you a way to express something where it sounds so beautiful and so kind. And it wasn't exactly what I wanted to say, but she's like, well, you can say this. And I'm like, that's brilliant. That's great. You know, you have to rely on the people around you and also know that, you know, you will encounter people who don't agree with what you believe and you can't control everything. You know, I think the biggest lesson is you can only control yourself, your reactions and your actions. You can't control anything else that any, anything that anyone else does. That is said. And I think that the mental health thing is really important. Um, and you remember that you're going on your own mental health journey every day and everybody else is too. So whatever crazy thing they said to you, they may need their own healing. And so don't take it personal. Maybe give them the space to find their healing as well. Um, but you can't take on every single thing that people are dealing with. And so, yeah, I think it's important to have that front. We've all had those moments of care where you want to cry and just close the door. And like you said, find a lifeline get it together, get back in there. And, um, you know, and again, I just can't say enough. It's a journey. And it's like every day, one day I'll be really good at it. And the next day I'll work on two steps back and have to start again. And it's just have that endurance, you know, really kind of see it as just, it's your life. It really is your life. You know? Thank you um, so much. Jamika, I am blown away by what is clearly just a sample of um, the brilliant folks that you have put together for um, the totality of Black Girls uh, Film Camp. This is extremely powerful. And I want to ask you to tell us how, um, as an audience and as supporters of your work, how we can best uh, support your next moves and uh, what, do you have, uh, what do you have coming up in the pipeline? Yes, so we are gearing up for Black Girls Film Camp 2022. Some of these amazing women are on our board and um, and continuing to be mentors. We have a lot more other um, women in the field in film and scholars, women um, that are in um, academic institutions that teach about women and gender studies and Africana studies that also are, are mentors to the girls and speak at the camp as well. Um, and so for anyone that's out there that's a filmmaker in the industry and wants to be involved, they can definitely um, go, to the, go to our website, blackgirlsfilmcamp.com and um, basically go to the contact page and reach out to us. And we would definitely love to have your, your mentorship or your involvement in any way um, to young girls, black girls out there that, um, that are interested in being involved, stay on the lookout. We'll be promoting the, um, the next cohort. And these young ladies also are going to be serving as uh, mentors to incoming girls um, because we're a family. They're, they're not going anywhere and we're gonna continue to promote their work. So of course their films are being screened here at the Mill Valley Film Festival, but they're also gonna be screened um, in other um, locations as well. We have something set up with Emory University. They're gonna be screened there with their Women's Center. Um, and so there'll be more conversations about this topic so we can um, share their stories to the world and support them with that. So um, super excited. Follow us also on social media, Instagram, Black Girls Film Camp. I'd like to thank, um, thank all you, of our Jamaica. panelists, our teens, veterans. Uh, Jamika, appreciate you so much for putting this together. Elizabeth, wonderful job in, uh, in your uh, interview with the girls. Um, I appreciate your time so much. To the audience, please support uh, Jamika's work, blackgirlsfilmcamp.com, and continue to pay attention to what she's doing because it's, it's, it's out of this world. Uh, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the Mill Valley Film Festival.